Welcome to the first of a 13-episode series on cells. Now, traditionally, this is one of the more difficult chapters for students, um, and I think it's mainly because there's so much stuff to remember. You're going to have to remember the cell theory, which we've kind of already gone over before during the uh, first chapter we talked about the characteristics of life. You've got to learn all the different parts of a eukaryotic cell, so all the organelles, nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, etc., You've also got to know how the cell membrane is built, or what its components are, and how they work during processes called passive transport and active transport. And then finally, you got to remember some basic stuff of how cells become tissues, become organs, become organ systems. It's just a long chapter. The PowerPoint for this one is actually 39 slides. So think about all that stuff that you have to remember. So I don't personally think it's a very difficult chapter, but for students, historically, it is because of just the amount of stuff that you need to remember and, and study. So on this chapter, you want to make sure that you watch these videos maybe once or twice. Make sure you take down really good notes and always but always make sure that when I write something on the screen, you write it too. All right, let's get down to business. Um, what we're going to start with here is how did we discover the cell in the first place? And it began during the Enlightenment with a gentleman named Robert Hooke. Uh, Robert Hooke is from England. It's very English to put an E here at the end of the name. And he was the guy that came up with the word cell. What he was doing is he was looking at cork cells. Uh, if you remember back from your world history study when you looked at the Middle Ages, is that you wouldn't want to drink the water because it was often contaminated, uh, usually with human waste. So you would drink stuff like wine or beer. And so in a typical English household, um, there wouldn't, don't be surprised to see some wine. That, and remember, wine bottles always got a cork in it. So what he did is he, he took a, a piece of cork and he shaved it into really thin pieces. And he looked at it under a very primitive microscope that you can see up here in the right-hand corner. And when he looked at the cork, he saw a pattern that looked kind of like this. He saw these little hollow squares. And he looked at these squares and he's like, hmm, that kind of reminds me of the rooms that a monk would live in inside a monastery. And those rooms that a monk lived in was called a cell. So he called these things on your screen a cell and that name just stunk. All right, I want you to look over here at this picture. This is his microscope. And up here you would see the object is right down in here. And then he's using a candle as a light source. And this candle right behind it would be a, a basically a, a bulb full of water. And this would be a heat sink. This thing right here would be a lens. And this lens would be just like a, micro, or a magnifying glass. Remember what you, you've probably done this before. You've taken a, micro, or a magnifying glass out in the sun and you focus the beam of light. Maybe you lit a, uh, a leaf on fire or a piece of paper or something using that. That's what he's doing here. So he's focusing the light down here on the uh, uh, object, and then the light's coming up here, and then the eyeball would go right here. Okay, so that's his his basic microscope from back in the 1665, which would be during the Age of Enlightenment. Okay, and then we have another. We have a Dutch guy named Anton van Leeuwenhoek, and he was the first guy to basically look at pond water under a microscope. So, so think of the first time that you were in elementary school or in middle school and you got to look at pond water and how cool it was to see those little protozoa swimming around in here. Well, this gentleman right here was the first guy probably ever to look at that. And he called these guys little animalcules, okay? And basically this is his microscope over here. And it's simply just a, a magnifying glass. This little point right there, he would put a drop of water on it and he could use this screw to move the object up or down, and they would use this screw to move it in and out. So the combination of those two screw, screws would bring the object into focus. And then he would look through the lens, which would be right there. Okay? All right. Uh, let's move on to the next one. All right. So now we've seen these cells 
in all kinds of different things. You're going to look at plant tissue, you would look at animals, you'd look at pond water, and you're going to see these structures called a cell. Well, we begin to get our knowledge of the cell during the 1800s. So we're talking about 100 years or so after uh, Hooke and von Leeuwenhoek were using early microscopes to discover these things. All right. So think of, uh, you know, you're talking just a couple of decades before the American Civil War. And we've got three German scientists whose work we're going to combine together to create the cell theory. And the first gentleman here is Matthias Schleiden. And let's get a different color in here. Let's go with red. Oops, wrong one. Okay, let's go with red. All right, Mr. Schleiden stated that all plants were made out of cells. And the great way for, that I used to remember what Schleiden did, think of that you slide in the grass. So think of Schleiden in the grass. And what's a grass made out of? It's a plant, okay? Uh, a year later, another German scientist, Theodor Schwann, he said that all animals are made up of cells. So think of this. A swan is an animal. Okay, so Schleiden in the grass, and Schwann sounds like swan, so it's an animal. Those are two pretty easy. All right, and then about 15 years later, another German scientist named Rudolf Virchow stated that all cells come from pre-existing cells. So basically, you would have one cell, and it would divide into two cells. And then those cells would divide into two cells each, and then you would get four. So all cells come from pre-existing cells. So you take these guys and put them all together, and you're going to have the cell theory. Now, the first one here, all living things are made of cells. Basically, the cell is the basic unit of life, and that goes into number two. So number one and number two, those always, always kind of sound the same. So the cell is the basic unit of life, and all living things are made out of cells. You put those two together... Uh, let's use a, let's pick a color here. Let's go with uh, this one. Okay, if you take one and two together, you basically have Schleiden and Schwann, their work put together. All, right. all living things are made out of cells. So if all plants are made out of cells and all animals are made out of cells, then probably all other living things are also made out of cells. And then the third part of the cell theory is New cells are produced by existing cells. That is just, you're adding in, whoops, let me spell that correctly. You're just adding in Verschau. All right, so Schleiden, Schwann, and Verschau. Put those together, and you've got the cell theory. All right, now everything is in color right in here, so make sure you know this one, because this will be a quiz and a test question. No doubt about it. All right. We only have 12 more episodes to go. So until the next time, we'll catch you on the flip side.